and supply. That your word will go forth in simplicity, but in accuracy and with power. That our hearts will be established in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. All right, it's always an honor to, um, to share God's word with God's people. And I want to thank your uh, pastor for inviting me, uh, stretching um, out an invitation. You can't take anything for granted in life. <laughs> All right. It's very important that you take nothing for granted. Amen. All right. I see many faces. Hmm? All right, then. So this morning in my true session, what I really want to focus on in a practical way is the subject of wisdom. Uh, I believe that, um, not, not just that I believe, uh, the scripture itself says very clearly, that there is nothing that a human being can desire on this earth that can be compared to what wisdom will give to that person. And when Solomon asked God for wisdom, uh, God said, you could have asked for several things, and I will have granted them. You could have asked for riches. You could have asked for long life. You could have asked for the lives of your enemies. You could have asked for all those things. But you asked for one thing, which is wisdom. And what he was saying, in effect, is that this is the root of every other expression. And therefore, because you have made this your priority, all these other things are going to be added on to you. Now, the thing of this meeting is um, restoration, all right? I remember about three weeks ago, I went to preach for... Um, leaders of a state, Christian organization, a state in, in Nigeria. And um, I forgot to read the thing. So it was very, I was a close shave. So I had prepared this message and they said leadership. And I was wondering because, I mean, it's a diverse crowd. I mean, I mean, they were translating in different languages. So, I mean, it was diverse. And when they say come and teach on leadership, you know leadership has this sophistication capacity, say, speaking English. So, and I was struggling to prepare the message. So I sat down, and um, the head of the whole region, the minister just finished speaking, and what he said was powerful, and just whispered to me, he didn't speak to the subject. So I looked up to check what the subject was. <laughs> I wrote a new sermon in 10 minutes. I just sat down, pa, 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 got up, and said, pam, and <laughs> preached in 35 minutes. All right. So it's always good to know what they told you to come and say. All right. <laughs> so the subject is restoration, all right, word and the move of the spirit. So let me start out by saying this. Historically speaking, a move of the spirit happens when an individual, it starts with an individual, looks at the accepted norm within the church, the standard, that has now been accepted as the norm in the church and reads their Bible and believes that there is some contradiction between what they are seeing in the scriptures and the accepted norm within the church. Now, when they see that, and a couple of people see that, some go into bitterness and become critics and start spewing out bitterness and all of that, particularly in terms of social media. But what the individual does is that the individual gets a small group of people together. Historically, this is how you have the move of the Spirit. And then they give themselves over to intercession and to prayer. And the purpose is to they understand that everybody is being sincere, but it takes some measure of light in order to function at a higher level than where you have accepted, all right, or is the standard. And so they are praying, and when that light begins to come, they start giving expression to that light inside their own life. And then what happens is, all of the Spirit begins by that as the Holy Spirit begins to fulfill what he has shown unto them. Now, there's a concept I will, first of all, explain, all right? Many of you might know it, but not, maybe may not use the same words that I'm going to use to explain this concept is to form the basis of this. And the concept is, there is what we call 
our position in Christ Jesus and the condition, all right, in our lives. In other words, there is the position that you have in Christ. That position was given unto you. It was a gift. It was the work of the Father in Jesus, and by the sacrifice of Jesus, before you came into existence, before you knew anything about God, the position was secured by Jesus. So that came as a result, I'll show this, of the work of Christ. It's your position. Your condition is who you are, all right, right now, in terms of visibly. So your position is who God has made you in Christ, what God has given to you in Christ. That position cannot be improved on. Nothing can be added to that position. There is nothing that can be done to make that position better. It is eternal in nature, and it is complete and perfect. But the condition is who we are visibly. In other words, what we are now in character, what we are, all right, what we have visibly, and who we are, all right, right now. So we have a position in Christ, and then we have a condition in which we are living. That position was given to us by Jesus Christ when he finished his work, and we were raised together to sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The Bible says in Ephesians, let's look at it, Ephesians chapter 2, explain what I'm saying, position here. That's what I mean by the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse. It says, and you have he quickened who are dead in trespasses and in sins. Well, in a time past, you walked according to the court of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. And then it goes on in verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, have he quickened us, Ephesians 2, 5, together with Christ, for by grace are you saved and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, which is now, in the dispensations to come, there's God's purpose. He wants to show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift. So there's a gift of God. Not of works let any man should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So we have a position in Christ, and then we have the daily condition of our lives. A position is who God says you are, your condition is who you think you are or who men say, all right, that you are. And we've said our position is perfect, cannot be improved on. Our condition is imperfect. And every single day, the condition of our lives, what's going on, should reflect, and this is what Christians are about, a daily, all right, greater measure of, of, of an outward showing of what we have in Christ and who we are in Christ. Now, Jesus came to the earth to get the position. He sent the Spirit to make sure that in the life of every believer, their condition matches that position. Are you following me? So when you have a move of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is wanting to get the condition in the lives of the people to look like their position. So when you have a healing move, you're saying, by the stripes of Jesus, they were healed. Let's go and get their bodies to look like what Jesus did on the cross. Okay? Are we together? 
All right? If it says God has caused all grace to abound towards you, giving you sufficiency, that is a positional thing. So the Holy Spirit has been sent to make sure, all right, that that scripture is actually the condition in which you are living in. That is, you have sufficiency in all things and you are able under any condition whatsoever at any given time to help in other people in general donations here. Yeah. Now, we don't change our condition by human effort. I'm going to get into that. We change our condition, all right? That's what Paul was saying when he said, haven't begun in the spirit. You got your position. Are you trying to change your condition through the flesh? It is the spirit who has been sent forth with the assignment to get the condition of our lives to look like, all right, the position that we have in Christ Jesus. It's a restoration work of the Spirit. Now, second thought I want to communicate is this, and this is very important. In making, and this place where we make a mistake also in our belief system, in making your condition look like your position, God doesn't change your condition directly in answer to prayer. He changes you. You change your condition. Are you following what I'm saying? In other words, if you say, like, I'm in business, and all my business to grow, you, it is that, we showed this here, God, that's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, 8, that the Spirit of God with an open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image. Which means you are changed into the same image. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. The Spirit is changing us into the same image from glory to glory there. Now, God's purpose has not changed. What he said at the beginning is what he's still doing in Christianity. What did he say at the beginning? Let us make man in our own image. After our likeness. If that is done, he says, then they can have dominion. Then they can be fruitful and multiply. If you don't make that person in your image, don't ask that person to dominate. So the person is not changing, but we want the circumstance to do what? To change. All right? And then we're trying to use praying and fasting and power to try to change things on the outside, which are a product of what James called the diseased condition of the soul. That's what James called it. And then we now start going into external things without getting the point first, which means you change, all right, that person. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 41. I'm going somewhere with this, Isaiah chapter 41. So we are praying, God, you know, I have a mountain in my life. I want you to move this mountain. And God says in Isaiah 41 verse 15, he says, Behold, I will make thee a sharp threshing instrument having teeth. And then what will happen? And thou, not me, you will thresh the mountains and beat them small and shall make the hills as chaff. So I will turn you into somebody or something else. And then you in that state will defeat the environment. Okay? Not that God, can you help me move this mountain? God says, listen, I'm going to change you. You will move the mountain. He told Joshua, this book gave him the way to do it. He says, won't depart out of your mouth. He says, if you do this, you will make your way prosperous. All right? You will build the business. It's not going to be by fluke. You will understand 
the principles, put it to work, and you can do it again and again and again. The same way you can ride a bicycle, you have been made into that now. Your soul has taken that shape. Your soul will take a shape. That's what it means. You get into a level of glory, which means it is a state now. Do you get what I'm saying? If you walk into a place that is dying, you tell them, these are the four things you need to do, and life will start coming. Look, please get where I'm coming from. Now, it could include prayer, but you could go there and say, look, let us pray, but you don't know what to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let's just fast and pray. As you're just, you're just, as they say in American football, throw the Hail Mary, which means let the ball go anywhere. I hope it lands close. You are just throwing something out. You really don't understand what you're saying. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19, Jesus told them, he said, I will make you, I will make you, all right? People are thinking about external things. And verse 19, it says, and he said unto me, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In other words, the way you have been made, all right, normal fishermen, now you'll be fishers of what? Men you will know how to get men. All right? You will have an understanding of how to do it. Let me just cut it short and say something here so people get what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. You know, when the right brothers, or, well, maybe not, but let's just say the right brothers, first we were to say that we're, um, uh, we're going to fly, and they started flying. You know, when you say, we're, we're going to fly, we're going to fly, we're going to fly, all right, it's by faith, okay? Nobody knows how to fly. Because if you knew how to fly, you'd be flying. So we're going to fly. A person saying, it will never work. It's not going to work. What rubbish is that? How can you go in the air? You come down like that. It's, we're going to fly one day, 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 we're going to fly. Finally, you understand how to build a plane. Once you understand how to build a plane, faith is no longer required. You can't teach it. The first person got it by faith. The second person got it by teaching. The first people were created. The people that came after were reproduced. Are you following what I'm saying? This is why, well, I mean, Western civilization, Judeo-Christian faith, came out of strong Christian background. They used faith to break into light. They understood light. And now can put faith aside and practice that light. Do you get what I'm saying? Because they understand the system. It has become part of their culture. It is the wisdom of God they received that they are making use of. All right? And the only way you ever get their attention is you exceed them in that wisdom. When nations that say we have God are producing what they can't produce, then they will ask you. But provided you are taking from them, they are not asking you. So let me say this again. As we go on, another concept here. Are are we together? Okay. Now, man is a spirit. So why don't we say why why God is transforming the man? Man is a spirit being. The Bible says, um, he that is born of flesh is flesh, and he that is born of spirit is spirit. So man is tripate. He is a spirit being. That's the essence of his being. He has a soul, and he lives inside his body. So when we say people die, what we are simply saying is that the spirit has left the body. Nobody really dies. Because when Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom and the rich man there went to Hades there, I mean, he remembered everything. He says, Father Abraham called. He knew he was Lazarus. He could identify. But his body was on the earth. How did he know him? How did he know him? He said, could you call, all right, Lazarus there to help me? He, he, he had that in his mindset. Number two, he remembered that he had brothers. All right? So as Christians... If a, if a Christian dies in faith, even if a human dies, well, he dies in faith, that's why I say Christians shouldn't weep because the person simply 
changed all right, their location. What really we are crying about is the body. That's what we are really crying about. Now, we, we, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's wrong to cry, but you just understand that what you are really shedding tears on is the body. The person has gone, which means you will never interact with that person again, but that individual is still alive somewhere. All right? So man is a spirit. He has a soul. Now, the soul consists basically, we'll say, of the mind, the will, and the emotions. And then the man lives inside the body. So we, uh, you live inside the body. So you are not who your body is. All right? So if someone says to you that you are this, that's not who you are. That's who you are after the flesh. That's physically what they're saying. Now, this position, truth here, but position, when you got saved, your spirit got recreated and was born of the incorruptible seed, created in the image and likeness of God, and that's your spirit. But your soul didn't change. Okay? And so the soul has to uh, now start changing, but the soul is responsible for the condition of your life, and it's not your spirit. Or else, once you go born again, the condition of your life will change. It's the soul. So the soul is responsible, which is the thoughts that you have, as a man thinketh, your emotions, which means what is going on in your life now is summation of your thoughts, your emotional responses to things in the past and all of that, and your will, the choices that you have made. That's your soul. That's what determines the condition all right, of your life. And your body doesn't follow your spirit. Your body follows your soul. The soul controls the body. Now, what God now wants to do is to get, that's what the Holy Spirit is inside for, within you, is to get him now to take over the soul of that person. Because once you start changing the soul of that person, you will start changing the outward things within that person. So what you want to change is the soul, all right, of that individual. That's why the Bible tells us in James 1.21, Receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to do what? Save your soul. This is what I'm getting to. It says in 2 Peter 1, 9, it says, receiving the end of your faith, the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul, which means the purpose of faith is to save your soul. Because once your soul is saved, you will change everything in your life. Look, you know, we preach these things and say favor, and we, which is true. But there is nobody in scripture that God promoted that didn't show capacity more than every other person. Listen, God is a judge. They didn't say God is a promoter. God is a judge. He marks the script. Daniel showed after they tested them. This is the condition of the soul. To have ten times more understanding than anybody in their realm, which means the state of their soul was different. Uh, when Isaac entered into the place, the Bible says there was famine there because there was no rain. I believe Isaac was the first human being that understood irrigation, that God showed him there is water beneath ground. Go there. It wasn't just that he sold and then he repaired. How did it happen? No, there was, he, there was an organization to the thing. Now, after Isaac broke through on that, then the whole of Israel could learn that technology and begin to use it. But the Christian is to be the apostle in those places. And there are several things that are beckoning for the manifestation of the sons of God. We'll understand it better now. All right. Same thing, Jacob entered. Laban didn't say to him that, you know what? You know what? I just like you. Laban said, I've learned by experience that since you're coming into this place, everything has multiplied. 
You go to the, read the first encounter of Jacob when he entered it. And he saw the way they were coming. Everybody would come. You know, it was at a set time. to roll the stone away for the animals to drink from the well. He said, why are you people waiting for this? The best time for these things to happen is this time. They said, no, no, no. We, we don't roll the stone here until everybody gather. He said, you are missing. So you could see that Jacob understood what was going on. I mean, Daniel didn't get there, or Joseph. And they said, Joseph, Potiphar just said, Joseph, you know, I like you. It wasn't that happened. Potiphar saw that anything Joseph was doing, and for you to see that, because you only gave him something small. He saw it. He said, he extended it. He saw that we gave him just this space. Everything in this space prospered. He said, all right, let's increase the space. He saw, he saw it prospered. He said, take over everything. Which means if we tap into that realm, look, every business owner wants to make money. That's why he's there. He's not there for any other thing. All right? He doesn't care whether if you, if you, if you come out and 95% of the profits in an organization came through you and you said it's through speaking in tongues, you get it. They will not discriminate against speaking in tongues. They only discriminate when you disturb people and at the end of the day, you are a liability. That's what they say. And then we can hide on and say they're persecuting Christians. But the question is, are you productive? Are you friends in? I was a gentleman I knew in Australia. He's a billionaire. He's a Christian. He said, if someone came to meet him, he's come there and said, you know, every time we're in a meeting, this guy always gets up and goes to the restroom during, during the meeting in the, of the board. I know that this, we don't like this. He, he told him, he said, listen to me, but 80% of the revenue comes from you. In fact, next time, if he doesn't go to the restroom, I will ask him, why have you gone to the restroom? <laughs> <laughs> you have not gotten up what's going on here. We don't know where the ideas are coming from. But you know what? We are trying to get promoted without touching our souls. We are trying to use faith for the promotion instead of using faith to transform our souls. Once our souls are transformed, they have to promote you. So the soul determines the condition, all right, in the life of that person. So James 1 tells us we should, all right, uh, receive the engrafted word of God that is able, all right, to save our souls. And, and, and God is a judge. God is really a judge. Okay? So he, he puts one down, puts another up, which could include his children. To say we put you down because you haven't done what you had to do. When you get it right. And when we get into wisdom here. Yeah. All right? Because the only reason why we fail, only reason, is a lack of wisdom. The only reason why we fail is a lack of wisdom. That's why John said, so James said, receiving the end of, sorry, James said, uh, receive with meekness the engrafted word of God that is able to save your soul. Peter said, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. John said, all right, three apostles that were with Jesus, said, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. So as your soul begins to prosper, all right, then it says you will now prosper and you also will now be, all right, will be in good health there. All right. So let me get to another concept before I finally settle down what I want to, what I want to explain. This first issue. So this, is this the third or fourth concept? All right, so let me get this concept here. And I use it several times. I, I, I've not been able to improve on it, so I'll use it again. But I want to show something with this. So I want to bring down this position, which is a gift, and condition, which is what is going on in a person's life. So let's assume that there was a 65-year-old man, and this man 
sat in his house, depressed. He had, life had been gone bad for him. He had an injury or some stuff, and things didn't work out. And he sits in his house, depressed, looks at his wife. Wife is struggling to make ends meet. Looks at the children. They're on the streets and everything. And, and you know, it, this is not what he really planned. And he's feeling bad, and he looks around. Now, uh, has no money, has, you know, he's just there. And a friend comes to see the man. And the friend sees him in that state. Now, that state that I try to describe is the condition of that man. Now, I, I him. now so that's the condition of the man. And then the friend gives him, let's say, 2,000 pounds. And the man looks and almost is in tears and says, you did this for me. Thank you very much. God bless you. And as the man was walking out, he noticed that there was a document somewhere. And he opened the document. And in reading the document, he discovered that this man's father actually left him when he died 35 years ago. A will, and this chap was illiterate to know what was inside. And he opened it and discovered that, I'm just to cut long story short, that the amount of cash he left for him 35 years ago has accumulated to almost 20 million pounds. Looked at it, he has five properties, all right, in the center of London that all powerful organizations are making use of the land. Looks at it, has farmlands on the countryside, calls the man who was crying because somebody gave him 2,000 pounds. Are you following what I'm saying? And then he opens his eyes to see the inheritance that he has. That inheritance is his position that he didn't work for, that was gifted to him by the father. Because he's ignorant of it, this is the condition of his life. Are you following what I'm saying here? Somebody comes to give him 2,000 pounds, he's crying on something that he has multiple forms of in his own account. Now, as ministers, we have given handouts to God's people instead of showing them their inheritance. And when we give them these handouts, they will be in tears. Powerful. Thank you so much. That is, without them knowing the wealth they have in Christianity. What did Paul say? Paul said in Ephesians, all right, chapter, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8. He said, uh, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8. He said, unto me, who am less than the least of the saints, is this grace given that I shall preach among the Gentiles the what unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of this mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God. So from the beginning of the world, this thing has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So the intent that now Unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the what manifold wisdom of God. So, first of all, look at this in Ephesians 1. What did he pray? He prayed that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that the eyes of your understanding might be opened up, that you might know the hope of his calling and the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Right? Which means every single believer has an inheritance. And, and I heard a preacher say this. He said it. I mean, you, you go, well, but he said it, and I, I kind of agree with him. He said, when the scripture talks about gnashing of teeth, that he didn't really say it's people going to hell that have gnashing of teeth. That even people going to heaven will have some regret. Because by the time God shows you all what you should have done on earth, and all what you missed out, I mean, some people will look at the preachers and say, you people. <laughs> If we are to go by works, you should enter this place with us. <laughs> All right? But if you, if, you, if you look at people, look and say, you mean, you mean what you planned for me in this situation was this. 
He says, yes. And I had no knowledge about it. No. So there's the unsearchable riches. Now, what are these riches here that are what they call unsearchable, which I want to get to in God's wisdom? Because, and then how to, because Paul said, I want to show how it works. Because it's one thing for us to say we have unsearchable riches. When we hear this in school days, we have unsearchable riches in Christ. The Greek word for unsearchable is inexhaustible. And everybody calls, yeah, 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 everybody gets excited. And we are back to nothing is changing. All right? So what does it mean to have unsearchable riches in Christ? He gave indication here. He says that this thing has been hid in God from the foundation of this world who created all things by Jesus. In other words... This is what God used to create the heavens and the earth that he wants to show you. That is how he did the entire thing. He wants to communicate that into the souls of his children. That not in their spirits now, into their soul, which means you understand how this thing works. So when you go into something, you know exactly what to do. Look, listen. It is one thing to know. You know, the Bible says God will supply. Let me explain it now. All of your needs according to what? His riches in glory by what? Christ Jesus. Now, that's these riches he's talking about you used to supply your need. Now, during the marriage feast, when there was no wine, you know, you can be pacing and saying, God shall supply. Now, there's no, and there's pressure. Where's the return? God will supply my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God, now, if you don't understand what you're saying, you're just saying it. And we like to say things in Christianity we don't understand. But everybody just repeats it. God will supply my need according to, what's the riches and glory by Christ? No, just say it. God will supply my need according to the riches and glory by Christ. God will supply my need according to the riches and glory by Christ. God will supply my need. Now, you know what? And you're walking past the pots and water. Not knowing that, the way to get the wine is fill these pots with water and draw it down. When he says God will supply you according to his riches, he's telling you according to this wisdom. In other words, wisdom is profitable to do what? Direct. So anything will be met once you have. Proverbs 24 and verse 13 and 14. Proverbs 24, 13 and 14 here. It says... Sorry, I went to Psalms. It says this, My son eat honey... Because it is good, and the honeycomb which is sweet to thy taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be to your soul when you have found it. There shall be a reward. And what's a reward? Your expectation will never be cut off. In other words, anything you want, there is a know-how. And he's saying here, your eyes will be opened up, this is what he's saying, to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus, which means you will get into the wisdom of God on how to go about. And it's that wisdom that comes into your soul. And when God's wisdom enters your soul, your soul is saved. It becomes something permanent. All right? Your soul is saved. You know, I used to wonder growing up, until recently, I now understood it. Why, you know, we Pentecostals, we have a superiority complex, eh? We believe because we speak in tongues, we speak loud in tongues, we are superior to normal people. Okay? That those that can't speak in tongues. Are bizarre. And, and I'll explain, let, let me just explain to you this speaking in tongues so we get it, so you understand what I'm saying. Remember Jesus said in the day of the last feast, John 7, 37, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Huh? He that believeth on me, as the scripture says, out of his bed he shall flow what? Rivers of living water. So you come, you're thirsty. This doesn't make sense like that. And you drink, and what is flowing out of you is rivers. You don't need rivers to quench your thirst. All right? So your being thirsty is a point of contact to meet the needs of several people. That's all. That's all. That, this is the understanding you must get. Which means, if you are in need, is God wants to use it, not to get you out of need, to get you into a place of abundance so that many people would never be in the situation you just experienced. Okay? But here is it. 
The Bible says it was the day of that great feast. Now, what's the great feast? I'm going to come back to it. What was the great feast? In the nation of Israel, they had three feasts within their calendar. That's three major feasts. They had the feast of Passover. And, and these feasts, that means it was after the Passover was sacrificed and the nation of Israel all right, were delivered from Egypt, they had to keep that feast there. Now, the New Testament tells us each of those feasts has an exact parallel in the New Testament. Because the Bible says, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore keep this feast. Okay? Jesus died on the same day the lamb was slain in Egypt. I mean, just to show you that, this, you couldn't, Jesus could not die until that day. That was during the feast of Passover was when Jesus was sacrificed as our what? Passover. Then the second feast was called the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost or it was called the Feast of First Fruits, which meant that the seed was sown, all right, and then you had what to call the First Fruits. When they meant First Fruits, this is what they were saying. That is, before the harvest comes, you are going to have the First Fruits, which means the sign. So, uh, well, we are preachers, so we preach like this. It's signs and wonders. So, you have the sign before you have the wonder. Okay? It rhymes now. <laughs> so it's signs and then what? Wonders. So you see the sign that this, there's potential here, and after some time, all right, wonders start. So when people begin to do things, the people will say, I always knew. I knew that guy 25 years ago. I knew that lady. And I knew. I always knew. All right? This is signs. Then you get to what? Wonders. So the first fruit, and it was the Feast was 50 days after the Passover. So, the Holy Ghost could not come until the day of Pentecost in the Jewish calendar. To show that that thing was a type. And that's why we are called Pentecostals. Because what we are saying is that we have experienced that feast. Evangelicals are that they have experienced the first feast. All right? Now, some problem in Pentecostal is that we don't understand the evangelical feast properly before we became Pentecostals. So the unleavened bread is still there. Or the leavened bread is still there. You know, you should keep the feast without leaven of malice. You can carry the malice and then get filled with the Holy Ghost. And then character is a problem, but you're speaking in tongues. But the evangelicals value character because they know that feast. We value speaking in tongues because we are Pentecostals. Do you get what I'm saying? Then the third feast is this one. It is now called the, the, it's called the in gathering. And we believe that this is going to be the feast that will usher in massive souls coming into the body of Christ. I believe, and I'm saying this, I believe that two people on this earth that have entered that feast is Pastor Debra and Bishop Edipo, my personal belief. And when you ask them, if you check them well and ask them, what's your key to success? They pray. They won't say prayer. They will say worship, thanksgiving, praise. Because that's how you drink with prayer. You release from your belly with the worship and praise. Are, are you, you following me? Saying? All right. So, that's the third feast. Now, that feast, you know, I quoted Ephesians chapter, let, let me just read the scripture here. Huh? I'm not digressing too much. Huh? You're, you're, I'm good, huh? Well, this wasn't part of what I wanted to say, but I just said as you say. Right. Now, it says this. Ephesians 1.17. That the God of our Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, you may know what is the hope of his calling. Sorry, before we get to that, that's the prayer. All right, it says in verse 12, okay, all right, uh -huh. verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, this is the inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him that walketh all things after the counsel of his will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who was trusted in Christ. He now says, in whom you also trusted after you heard of the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after you believed, you were sealed 
with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. So he was talking about the inheritance, and he says the Spirit, after you believed, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the place of his glory. Now, what does he mean by this? The word earnest there is an old English word for a shorty or a guarantee on payment, which means, for example, if I go into a shop and I see a large television screen and I want the television screen, and let's assume the term the television screen is 1,000 pounds and all I have is 200 pounds. And I look at the television screen and I say, listen, I want this thing, I want this thing, I want this thing. I, 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 can't, I can't pay for this thing. It says, well, it's up for grabs. Uh, I say, okay, right, can I give you 200 pounds? All right, as my shorty here, which means that until I come for the redemption of the purchase possession, the person says yes. So I will set it aside for a period of time for you to bring the 800 pounds, and then it will become yours. But it has been set aside for you. What he's saying is, after you got born again and got sealed with the Holy Spirit, that was the setting aside of certain things for you until the redemption of the possession that has been paid for. How then will that redemption happen? Then he went on and says, that is why I'm praying that the Lord God of Father of Lord Jesus will give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that the eyes of your understanding may be opened up. That you may do what? Know the hope of his calling and the riches, which means the third thing there will come from the opening up of the eyes. And once your eyes are opened up and you see what you are going to be doing is rejoicing in the reality of what you have seen. Look, the minute that man sees the will, that all that money is his, that is when he experiences the joy. Not when he gets it. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, if you see things in the spirit, you will go to the office the next morning. Nothing will have changed, but people will ask you, what just happened to you? Something has changed. Why are you so happy? No, 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 you're laughing. You're laughing too much. Something, they, no, 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 this laughter. We just say anything this morning, you're laughing. Ah, why are you laughing so much? What's why? You are, no, you are happy. This is not forced joy. This is joy unspeakable, full of glory. Though you haven't seen him, you, there is something, it's joy unspeakable. You have a joy that you can't even articulate with words. That some will take a dance to be able to give expression to it. What has happened? You've seen something. You know the two men, because of time, you know the two men that after Jesus was raised from the dead, they went to the tomb and saw the tomb there and saw Jesus, all right, right there in the tomb. Uh, Jesus, the tomb was empty, and then they came and said, you know, and Jesus came, and Jesus was walking on the streets, and met these two gentlemen on the street. And, and he said to them, he said, why are you guys so sad? The two men said, are you a, they're telling Jesus now, are you a stranger in this town? Are you a stranger? Have you not heard about Jesus? You are telling Jesus. That have you not heard about Jesus? And Jesus said, and then he looked, said, and just now began from the scriptures to expound. And he was teaching them. And he was teaching them. And they didn't know it still was Jesus until their eyes were open. And then suddenly they said, Ah, did our hearts not burn within us when he shared? You can be getting the word shared to you that your heart is burning, but you don't see that word in your everyday life. Are, are you from saying? You actually don't see that word, I mean, in your everyday. I mean, all right, let, let me see here. I mean, so this would be fair play. We're in London. I remember we are Chelsea fan. Let me see. That. No, let me see. You are London guys now. All right. So, so, so what's the name of your coach? Toshel. All right, your coach now, that's him. Yes, yes. Thomas, Thomas Abby? Okay. How many are Manchester United fans? Ah, there are many. Okay, so you are getting a new coach. So what, no, no, no. So what's his name? Huh? Okay. You know he has a relationship with Toshel. 
and club that he mentored both of them. But the interesting thing about Tushar, which is very powerful, was Tushar was playing under him in a second division club and got injured and decided he was going to be a steward washing plates in restaurants. This man said, there's something inside you I think you should go into coaching. And forced him to come and coach the under 15 team in the club where he was until what was inside him came out. Do you understand what I'm saying? What I'm trying to say is that you can read the scriptures and not see Jesus. I told you, you can be confessing. God will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory and be walking past the pots. God is never far away from anybody. The breakthrough is always one instruction away. That's why when that man was with Elisha, and Elisha said, and, and that's what Paul, Paul listen, I, I think it'll be because Paul must have been frustrated. And I think this prayer he offered up was after he taught the Galatians, and he taught, and people came and doctrine, and he said, he said, who hath bewitched you? He said, didn't we set forth Christ before you? How are you swayed this easily? Then he knew there was something else in ministry outside mental ascent to God's word. That a person can comprehend the word of God intellectually, but the only truth you have is what you have experienced. So God must have shown him that, look, there is something else. You've got to pray for these Christians. And if there's anything Christians resist, is that they don't know. They always feel we can't we can see. Well, I mean, if you tell a Christian and listen to me, you might be blind. He says, no, no, no. The God of this world has blinded the blind of them that believe not. <laughs> Lest the glorious, the light has come into me. So what we are calling light is not light. This is the point I'm trying to get to. Because if you still think that that is light, then you think that the fact that you can intellectually comprehend something means that you have the revelation of that particular thing. Elijah was there. The man said to him, he said, he said, he said why are you so calm? Elijah said, more are with us than against us. Because he looked, he said, can't you see all the chariots? Now, we also like that kind of confession. Now, now, when the chap looked at Elijah and said, and he was still disturbed, Elijah didn't say, go and keep confessing. More are with us than against us until you have worked on yourself psychologically and then come back persuaded about what you have been repeating to yourself. He knew his business. He said, God, open his eyes that he might see. That means that he was blind. He it was it. And so what happened was his eyes were opened. The minute he saw the angels, he said, We are okay. <laughs> the, he too entered into what? Rest. Once your eyes are open to the inheritance, not that they explain it, that you see it. You get what I'm saying? So what's this riches here? It's wisdom. Okay, nobody ever told me that it was wisdom. Nobody. I would just say it was riches of his glorious inheritance. The Greek word for glorious is this. For, and, and then we are all happy. We are quoting these things, and you know, and we go home. All right. But it's wisdom. Why is this wisdom? Number one. That's what Jesus was referring to. When he said, if you are not faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who shall give you the what? True riches. Is this what he was talking about? That's what Proverbs was talking about when he says, let's read it in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 4. And verse 7. It says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, do what? Get wisdom. And with all thy getting, 
get understood. Exalt her and she shall promote thee. She will bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thy head an ornament of grace and a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Hear, O my son, receive my sayings, and your years shall be what? Many. For I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in the right path. Proverbs 8 verse 1. Uh, some verse, okay, it says, doth, wisdom, doth not wisdom cry, all right, and understanding putteth out her voice. Then it says in verse 10, receive my instruction, and not what? Silver. Knowledge rather than what? Choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that, that may be desired cannot be what? Compared to wisdom. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find out, all right, the knowledge of witty inventions. I mean, if material wealth is anywhere now, it's with witty inventions. Then it says, verse 14, counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding, I have strength. By me, kings reign and princes, all right, decree justice. By me, princes rule, nobles, even the judges of the earth. I love them that love me, and they that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, fine gold, and my revenue than what? Choice silver. So the riches there. So in the second session, I want to talk about practice of wisdom, and we enter into it. Well, first I want to establish is, is this wisdom. And it's not just um, um, you know, when you have spiritual growth, and I learned this from mistakes in leadership, growth doesn't mean, spiritual development doesn't mean, a person who is spiritual doesn't mean they are zealous about the things of God. A person can be very zealous, but not be developed. Spiritual development is a function of wisdom. That's why the Bible says we may all come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. But when you go and look at Jesus when he was growing, he says he grew in wisdom and stature. That stature, fullness of Christ, is that wisdom growth. Okay? And wisdom. You know, my pastor, when I was growing up, was a, used to do, he, 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 well, he, he was doing a PhD in physics, or well, he did a PhD in physics, Pastor Libby Johnson in Baden. And he said something one day in church, and I, I couldn't understand what he just said. He said, I will give you the full calculation of an atomic bomb, and I'll explain it to you right now on this board, but I don't know how to build one. In the process of building, I probably will die <laughs> from the calculation. But the people that are building it is this same calculation. Do you understand this? So you may know something, but not have the wisdom of how to do it. So the riches is not the mental accumulation. It's the word know-how. That's why the Western world will tell you, when people say, well, we have nuclear, they say, you can't have it. We will know if you have it. Because you will have to practice firing it. And every time we fire, we will know how much you are getting it. By the trajectory, we will know. So if you, you can never just do this thing in a lab, you have to do what? Test it. So here is the truth we can have a strong accumulation of, of knowledge and we avoid of wisdom. All right? And then somebody else is heavy on wisdom 
but doesn't seem to know as much as you know. Uh, you get what I'm saying? I've been to see Pastor Debo recently about planting churches. And he spoke to me for 20, I said I was saying for 20 minutes, and he spoke to me for 20 minutes. It was the, I'm, I'm not saying this was the most impactful 20 minutes of my life. I knew that people don't know that man. When I sat alone, they do not know who he is. People don't understand the vastness and its practice. It's, they, you've broken, you've moved from that place of just that knowledge to that world of wisdom. And when you get to that world of wisdom, it's a world of works. It's a world of manifestation. All right? It's a world where if you don't get the results, then you don't know it. You can't say you know it without the results. Anything you know shows. And if it is not showing, you don't know it. Full stop. To say I know and it's not showing is not the wisdom of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word and by the power of your spirit, I ask you to establish us in this truth as we go on in this conference. Cause the grace to grow with every single session in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.